I'm Dr. Raj Sood. I'm a Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Services for BRCA, Burn and Reconstructive Centers of America, based in Augusta, Georgia. My topic today is uh, to present an algorithmic approach to burn care and management. Just a little word about BRCA. Uh, we are a large network, probably the largest in the world. We have centers as listed on the slide. Uh, and about 15 to 20% of all burns uh, in the United States are taken care of in our centers. Uh, we, are, we have 16% of all the burn beds in the United States, so, so a rather large system. As disclosures, I'm on the advisory board and a consultant to Vita Medical, and I'm a consultant for Smith & Nephew. Uh, of note also, any, any um, uh, honorariums that are paid go into a nonprofit fund for mission work, uh, not paid to me directly. Uh, the faculty has been informed of their responsibility to post to the audience if they will be discussing off-label or investigational use of drug products and or devices, i.e. any use not approved by the US FDA. Uh, applicable CME staff have no relationships to disclose relating to the subject matter of this activity, and this activity has been independently reviewed for balance. This CME activity includes device or medicine brand names for participant clarity purposes only, no product promotion or recommendation should be inferred from the presentation. So our, our objectives are as follows, uh, to identify burn care, what it is, to identify challenges in burn care, to recognize resources to address those challenges, to educate peers on burn care solutions, and finally to explore cases on burn management solutions across the spectrum of care. I'm gonna be talking as part of my talk on the epidemiology of burns, uh, what a burn team and a burn unit means and what it, uh, a good unit looks like, uh, to share with you types and depth of burns, the phases of burn treatment, and finally wound management, which in, in, is inherent in, in burn care. So just uh, some statistics. Uh, worldwide, uh, there are about a quarter million deaths, uh, the majority uh, from burns. The majority are in low and middle income countries. And the majority of those are fire related, usually stoves, cooking, et cetera. Um, the rate of child deaths is seven times higher in low and middle uh, income versus high income countries, uh, and roughly three fire deaths per 100,000 uh, uh, inhabitants. Um, interesting statistic, 1% uh, of all fires actually do result in death. Uh, 11 million people also require treatment and the the disability cost of that can add up to $80 billion in lost, lost productivity alone. Uh, and then of course there's the cost of direct fire losses. Uh, this is World Fire Statistics Center data. Uh, directly it's between 0.06 to 0.26% of a country's GDP, uh, but the indirect costs go up even more. And this accounts for 1% of all hospitalized treatment costs and 2% of all non-hospitalized treatment costs. In the US, we see about 400,000 burns, about 40,000 require hospitalization. And just for children to take care of children, the direct costs are over $200 million. Uh, overall, epidemiologically, uh, female are equal to male, although in the United States, more male burns occur than female burns. Uh, work and home place, uh, our workplace and home are the most common sites. Uh, and what's interesting is, that the majority of these burns uh, can be preventable. In some series, up to three quarters of burns uh, can be potentially preventable. Um, adult women are risk factors, children, because of maltreatment or not being supervised appropriately. Um, socioeconomic status, obviously, uh, overcrowded conditions uh, where there's an inherent lack of safety measures. Uh, young girls are you know, cooking and doing household roles. Uh, and then the other risk factor are medical conditions. Uh, epilepsy and seizures obviously are a big part of this, peripheral neuropathies uh, and diabetics. And then those patients with uh, uh, physical and cognitive disabilities who are not able to escape on their own, their environment. Other risk factors obviously include alcohol and the smoking. Uh, those scenarios that have easy access to chemicals such as the whole methamphetamine industry. Uh, we see a lot of burns uh, in Indiana related to that. Uh, those areas where kerosene is used as a fuel source um, or where there are inadequate safety measures for petroleum and electricity. And then finally, fireworks uh, are another source, particularly in, in uh, the rest of the world uh, of burn injuries, particularly among children. 
And if we look at the typical sort of bell curve distribution of cases, uh, this is uh, national burden repository data from the from America, uh, but the majority uh, are uh, the age categories are obviously what you would expect: a small peak uh, early from one to five, and then from uh, twenty to forty, uh, and that's the majority of of both males and female burns that we see. And this is actually very interesting. The the reality is that the number of cases and the average total body surface area burn in a unit in a burn center in the United States is typically around 7%. So we can tell here that the majority of burns, fortunately, that are seen in centers or not even seen in these centers because these cases are 125,000 cases are less than 30% burns for the most part. Um, <clears throat> and just to sort of segue onto that, uh, this is a, uh, a good way uh, to determine the chance, of the, the probability of survival, or actually the probability of death after burn injuries. And the simple BOS score is total body surface area plus age. Uh, and the modification called the modified BOS score is total body surface area burn plus age. And then if they have a documented inhalation injury at 17. And as you can see on the nomogram on the right, uh, mortality goes up significantly uh, once you approach about 135 uh, for a revised modified BOS score. So again, this information is important in terms of communication with families, uh, patients, but also for your team uh, and also for us to be able to judge how well we're doing, uh, particularly with uh, higher BOS score injuries, uh, to be able to compare against each other and to optimize our care. When we look at uh, the etiology of burn, obviously flame bur fire burns and scald are the most common. Um, we tend to see uh, more and more in burn centers as the numbers of uh, large total body surface area burns have decreased. We tend to see a lot of uh, skin diseases, uh, necrotizing fasciitis or uh, TENS and SSS, uh, et cetera. And, and you know, burn centers, as we'll talk about in a minute, are ideally set up to take care of these patients, both from a critical care perspective, as well as fluids, as well as uh, certainly wound management. Um, and then when we look again at the same national burn repository data from the US, you look at the, the chance of uh, uh, dying and obviously mortality goes up directly proportional to the percent total body surface area. So at about, a, 70 to 80% burn, you've got about a 60% chance of uh, mortality, 80% uh, burn, almost an 80% and greater than 90, almost a 90%. Um, and, and these data, again, are useful for us to be able to use in communication, but also when we're comparing how we're doing, uh, how, our, uh, how our care differs from others, very important that we sort of, uh, uh, you know, know this data. So I, I think about what a burn center needs to do. Uh, obviously, we need to treat the wound until closure. We need to optimize function. We need to maintain nutritional balance. We need to meet psychosocial needs, control pain, manage infection. Uh, and a big part of my, the later part of my career has been to work on things that uh, minimize scarring in particular. And I think the key thing now is, you know, we can save a lot of patients with large burns but really minimize scarring and returning these patients to a, a functional level in society is critical. Uh, and really, you know, if you look at sort of the aspects of uh, the, the eras of burn care, we're certainly at that point where, yes, we know from a critical care perspective, we're better from a wound closure perspective, we're better. Uh, but let's focus on getting these patients back, not just helping them survive. And all of this, by the way, requires a truly multidisciplinary approach. It, it cannot be overstated. I, I don't think there is any other uh, 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 disease process that uses such a fine-tuned multidisciplinary approach as burns. And I think most of us who've been involved with burn care uh, are probably attracted to that part of, of, uh, of burn care. Now, the services provided uh, in our centers, inpatient, outpatient, operative, that includes both acute burn care and certainly reconstructive burn care, rehabilitation, research, community outreach, and then support services. So when you're putting together a center, when you think about a burn center, it isn't just uh, one aspect. Uh, most, most centers in the US have 
all, most or, not, or all of these uh, components as part of their care delivery model. And the multidisciplinary team is also very important. They're listed here, you know, physicians, ABPs, advanced practice providers, nurses, assistants, o therapy is critical, dietary, pharmacy, particularly critical care pharmacy, uh, social services, uh, case management. And I put in their esthetician, as you know, when I when we built the burn centers in Indiana, um, we specifically put a, a spa into those burn centers and had an esthetician, uh, primarily to offer the same services to burn survivors as one would on the outside. So we'll talk a little bit about program management. Uh, teams typically around two to five days a week. Uh, there is educational uh, 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 component to this, including professional development. Uh, you also are, it's very important to identify process improvement opportunities. And I think one of the key things is that all members uh, should contribute and do contribute to burn care. So, you know, it has to be a fairly democratic process. Obviously, somebody has to make decisions in that algorithm, uh, but gathering data and providing data is a function of all team members. Um, we talked about types of burns. So thermal burns, flash is the most common. Uh, again, for most of these, the depth is proportional to the amount and type of fuel. Flame burns, same thing. It's invariably a much deeper burn. Uh, also, the caveat being, and we talk about it in a later slide, but uh, remember that some of this is dependent on what part of the body gets injured. The, the dermis is thicker and thinner depending on different parts of the body. And so the depth of injury will be determined partly by um, partly by uh, where uh, the injury occurs. Flame burns are more often associated with inhalation injury and concomitant trauma. Uh, and typically, if you're there are a lot of patients we see smoking in bed, et cetera, if your bedding or clothing catches on fire, these typically have full thickness burns. Uh, skull burns are the most common cause for pediatric burn admission and or the elderly. Um, you know, spilling hot drinks, pulling drinks out of a microwave, uh, ramen noodles with, you know, salt, et cetera, uh, exposure to hot baths. And also remember that the depth of burn depends on temperature. We talked about skin thickness and the duration of contact. For example, water at 60 degrees, 60 degrees creates a deep dermal burn in about three seconds. Water 10 degrees warmer creates a deep dermal burn in one second. Um, and so typically, uh, it is related to, again, temperature of the offending agent, the thickness of skin, and how long you're in contact. Uh, and grease and oil burns also, uh, because of their ability to bind to proteins, uh, tend to cause deeper dermal or, or burns. Contact burns, um, again, uh, the object must be extremely hot or, or the duration is prolonged. And we often see contact burns in patients who've had a seizure or they don't have full cognition because of drug or alcohol abuse, or uh, certainly elderly with loss of consciousness. consciousness. Um, other types of burns include chemical burns, electrical burns, and although frostbite is not a type of burn, it certainly does cause skin and, and sometimes deeper uh, fourth degree uh, uh, full thickness injury. So the extent of damage in summary depends on temperature of the agent, concentration of heat, the duration of contact, and finally, the thickness of skin. The thinnest skin of the entire body is the upper eyelid, whereas glabrous skin uh, uh, of the palm and plantar and the lower back have the thickest dermis. Also remember that infant skin is much thinner than adult skin. Uh, so, so for the same amount of contact, contact a, uh, an infant will get a deeper burn. Another rather important concept is this concept uh, advocated by Jackson, uh, where we, we talk about the three zones of injury uh, in a burn. So this uh, sort of zone A is the zone, uh, as depicted on this slide, is the zone of coagulation. And here, whatever has caused the injury, denatures cellular proteins, causes loss of extracellular matrix, and you've got a full thickness injury. Around it, the zone B is the zone of stasis. Here, the dermal microvasculature perfusion decreases. This is a potentially salvageable situation. We'll talk about that. Um, and then finally, zone C is the zone of hyperemia, which is the body's response, increased perfusion. And, and really all aspects of, of burn care uh, are focused on preventing that zone of stasis, that zone B, from becoming a zone A. And the other caveat to that is when we talk about conversion of a burn wound, so if we've got a 
mid partial thickness wound and we come back in 48, 72 hours and it's become, uh, looks deeper. Uh, it is because this zone stasis has converted to a zone of coagulation. And from a pathophysiologic standpoint, uh, what happens is cell membranes get damaged with heat and injury, inflammatory mediators are released. Uh, and there's an activation of a uh, normal cascade, uh, inflammatory cascade, including complements. And then we get activation of ox uh, oxygen-free radicals, which cause further tissue damage. We also get release of histamine, which allows us to have an increase in vascular permeability, which uh, is very important in burn care. We'll talk about that in a minute. So another important concept is uh, the sort of the systemic response caused by burn injury. Very important to realize that we get a total body increase in capillary permeability. So anything greater than a 20% burn pathophysiologically results in loss of capillary, particularly at the venule level, endothelial junction integrity, which causes a tremendous leak of almost everything. And the maximum edema occurs typically within eight to 12 hours post-entry. And <clears throat> how much tissue edema we're gonna have partly also depends on how appropriate we are with our resuscitation. So, you know, again, the caveat being that it's very, very important to resuscitate ideally and not, neither under nor over. And that is uh, both art and science related. When we look at depth, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute, superficial burns are red and erythematous, capillary refill is good. We should heal just fine. Superficial partial thickness burns are also pink and red. There's some epithelial budding, capillary refill is good. They usually heal within a week. Partial thickness, which is mid-dermal, uh, red to light pink, they could be a little clear white, uh, cap refills a little sluggish. They usually will heal within two to three weeks. And, you know, once we get partial, deep partial, full thickness burn, we, it's very, very important that we think about whether these wounds are going to heal. We want burn wounds to heal within two to three weeks. Uh, and we'll talk about why, but as we're making a decision of partial, deep partial, full thickness injury, Remember that what we're doing is destroying more of the dermis, right, with the burn. And the dermal elements of the hair follicles and sweat glands are how we get regenerative healing. So as we lose more of the, that area, uh, we're not, we are uh, removing the ability of, of skin to be able to auto heal. Superficial partial thickness burns. Again, we used to use the nomenclature first, second, third degree. We tend to uh, stay away from that. We tend to be more physiologic in how we describe injuries. So superficial partial thickness burn is the epidermis is disrupted, pink in appearance. Maybe it's quite painful. Um, it may blister. And typically these will heal just fine. And uh, this slide just shows sort of the thought process of what do you do with uh, blistering? My, my, some people feel uh, that their blister flu is good. It's a good biologic dressing. Dressing. I don't disagree with that. I think in areas that are uh, that uh, blistering and the wound impact range of motion, such as in the hand, for example, uh, I would tend to debride that and put topicals right onto the wound bed. But here we can tell the dermis looks pink, it's shiny, blood flow is great. If we did cap refill, it looks good. And this should have uh, no problem in healing within a, a week or so. Mid partial thickness injuries, the papillary dermis is involved. There is an area of eschar, uh, which is denatured protein. Uh, there may be some delayed blanching because remember, not all burns are the same depth. They typically are never the same depth. And even in the same arm burn or forearm burn or et cetera, you're going to get variable levels of injury. Uh, mid partial thickness burns tend to be pale pink. Uh, they can be, they are painful, uh, but with appropriate care, they may heal on their own. And this is a partial thickness, one can see hair follicles, buds. Uh, this is the patient post debris mine. You can tell there are areas that look rather pink. There are areas that look somewhat whiter. Again, most of these burns tend to be uh, mixed depth burns. Deep partial thickness burns. Now here we've got the reticular dermis and the skin appendages, as I mentioned, involved. They're drier, the eschar is present, minimal blanching, still can be painful. Uh, and typically these will require some type of uh, wound coverage to heal within that time period that we've talked about. Um, and this is an example of a mid to deep partial thickness burn. Again, I would argue that this is variable. Uh, there are all sorts of depths, but all sorts of depth of injury. 
Uh, but some of this may blanch, some of this will not. So most of it is painful. It's a mid to deep partial thickness injury. And so as well here, mid partial to deep partial. Full thickness injury is burned through epidermis and dermis into the subcutaneous tissues. Very classically described as white leathery eschar, typically insensate, is dry, and typically these wounds will not heal without skin grafting and uh, fairly obvious uh, full thickness uh, type injury here to the lower extremity. Uh, fourth degree burn, I'm going back to using fourth degree when I said we shouldn't use degree of burns, uh, but it's burned through all layers of skin into muscle or bone. Uh, typically these are either prolonged uh, exposure or electrical injuries, and certainly very important to evaluate compartmental pressures in these patients. Uh, and they will almost always need some type of uh, probably complex wound closure besides just grafting. Uh, again, this is a contact burn on a patient. Uh, he actually also had an intracranial injury from this, believe it or not. Uh, lost his ear, but kept his eye. Uh, this is post fasciotomy, lower extremity from an electrical injury. Uh, again, these can be pretty devastating injuries and you can tell there's some myonecrosis and you can also look at the significant bulging uh, of the uh, released muscle. So we all know how to treat burns, A, B, C, D, E's. Uh, we have to get large bore IVs in, um, uh, uh, breathing, circulation, remove belts, clothes, give some supplemental oxygen. If you've got a potential inhalation injury and uh, there is an airway issue, well, then you need to make the decision to, to uh, intubate the patient. Uh, and we typically don't cool with ice or cold water. Several reasons for that. Uh, there's certainly the, the probably the most common reason is that the patients are already hypothermic when they have a large burn, uh, but cold water can make them even more hypothermic. Um, and the uh, there is some evidence that suggests that uh, putting cold water on on a burn wound will also decrease dermal blood flow. Uh, so again. Uh, uh, that is not a good idea, just room temperature water. We talked about phases of burn treatment, very important because I think that a lot of us um, sort of categorize um, burn treatment into these phases and they become very relevant in terms of what type of care is to be provided during each phase. So we'll talk through these phases uh, during this talk. Resuscitation phase, typically uh, uh, zero to 48 hours-ish. Uh, Post-resuscitation phase, day two to six. Uh, typically when the patients go to the operating room, the inflammation and infection phase starts at about seven days. And then finally, remember that uh, rehabilitation wound remodeling phase uh, can be up to a year. Um, the resuscitation phase is, is characterized by cardiopulmonary instability, by burn shock. Uh, and we talked about why that is. We've got this big opening uh, capillary permeability across our entire body. Uh, not just in the areas that are burned, right? So anything we give the patient and we have to give patients fluid to match uh, this leak rate uh, will still leak. Uh, this phase is also characterized by pulmonary abnormalities and the wound management uh, at this time is uh, usually non-surgical and includes escarotomies. Well, this talk was about um, <clears throat> resuscitation. Um, and this is uh, this was a protocol that we came up with uh, at my previous uh, job at Fairbanks Burn Center, Indiana. But really the, the point here is that uh, the, the, the reality is that nurses at the bedside are, are the best and most efficient at being able to resuscitate patients once they understand the process. And setting up a, an algorithmic approach leads to better um, um, uh, manipulation and modulation of the amount of fluid given. So, you know, it's, these are laid out very clearly. Here's what you start with. Here's what you give for the first eight hours and for the next 16 hours. Uh, these are the labs you need to send. What happens with the urine output in? Sort of the other major change that's, that's occurred uh, in burn care, uh, certainly in my 30 years of doing burns, is um, that we are very careful. You know, we used to assume that we were resuscitating well if there was tons of urine output. And what we realize now is that that is absolutely the worst thing to do, that there's, uh, you know, this process of burn creep, fluid creep, uh, and the, the higher expectation of urine output is, is erroneous. Uh, so really a half a cc per kilogram of urine output for an adult and one cc per kilogram is, is a well accepted, <clears throat> keeps you sort of in the middle of that curve of resuscitation uh, and really is what we should be aiming for. 
This is the next 12 hours. Again, very algorithmic driven. We switched, uh, I, I, at least my protocol uh, switches to half and half, uh, which is half crystalloid, half colloid. Remember at this point, the burn has presumably stopped its leak. And so that we can start adding <coughs> colloid in the hopes of decreasing the total amount of fluid given to the patient. Fair amount of controversy in that is not my recommendation. It is what I've practiced. And I think that when we look at overall fluid uh, intake or what we have to give the patient, this is a good way to go. So the consensus burn formula, uh, lots of iterations, lots of formulas in the literature. We start out at two to four cc's per kilogram per percent body surface area burnt. We give half of that in the first eight hours. We give the second half of the next 16 hours, exactly for the reasons that we talked about, that during the next 16 hours, uh, you should have a decrease in uh, leak, and uh, you can presumably give somebody uh, a different type of fluid if you do. Also to realize that uh, there is no uh, agreement around the country or even around the world that what's ideal resuscitation, um, i.e., if one were to keep giving crystalloid during the resuscitation phase, that is certainly a good way to do it. Um, and the, the principles are still the same. Watch how much you're giving uh, patients. Um, don't give them too much. Don't assume that a lot of urine output is good urine output because it typically isn't. Uh, and we'll typically end up over resuscitating these patients. Um, excessive resuscitation leads to edema, uh, pulmonary edema, cerebral edema, uh, decreased peripheral perfusion, et cetera. So uh, lots of consequences to, to excessive resuscitation. Our goals are very simple, maintain organ perfusion and avoid giving too much or too little. Inhalation injury, um, still, even, even today, um, the smoke inhalation causes uh, greater than half the burn, half the fire-related deaths we see. So pulmonary injury is still the number one cause of deaths in burn patients. Uh, and actually that mortality has not changed. Uh, the risk factors include enclosed space, uh, facial burns, uh, uh, soot on uh, mucous membranes, et cetera. And the signs and symptoms include wheezing, carbon particles, hoarseness, uh, if they've got a chest burn, obviously they may have restricted uh, motion of the trunk, uh, burns of the oral mucosa, or, you know, the, probably the most critical thing we think about is, you know, what was the history? Uh, history should raise a significant, significant flag in the patient taking care of the, uh, the person taking care of the patient uh, to rule out inhalation injury. Um, carboxyhemoglobin is a way we measure the rough amount of inhalation injury we have. Um, and again, normal carboxyhemoglobin in a non-smoker is between 0.1 and 1. And uh, the numbers listed here are sort of the symptoms of both CNS and cardiac symptoms that one gets uh, with uh, increasing levels of carbon monoxide. This is just a basic slide showing you uh, what uh, somebody with inhalation injury, you can tell it's got a facial burn, obviously, but if you look inside the mouth, there's soot, uh, singed nasal hair, et cetera. And this is a, a patient who underwent a bronchoscopy. Remember that uh, inhalation injury needs to be diagnosed. Uh, patients with inhalation injury will, will typically require more fluid uh, than patients that don't have inhalation injury for the same total body surface area burn. So this is a patient on day one, uh, diagnostically. Uh, and two days later, when we re the patient, this is what the bronchoscopy looks like. This has to be cleaned out. We typically send cultures. If, the, if they're culture positive, I will tend to treat these patients uh, with antibiotics. Um, but this is just to show you what leak looks like and therefore to show you what you know, uh, loss of mucosal integrity and all the sloughing that occurs in the airway looks like. And then two days later, if we've done a good job, we should start to see some reparation, some healing, uh, as we see here. Cyanide is another uh, common occurrence uh, in closed injury, uh, burning rubber, plastic. Uh, the the uh, classic symptoms are nausea, madriasis, vomiting, uh, uh, coma. And the people describe this bitter almond odor uh, that one may um, uh, see. I, I think most of us feel that um, patients who have uh, potential cyanide poisoning, uh, poisoning or potential for cyanide injury uh, should be treated appropriately. Uh, and there's lots of ways to treat them. Um, 
They potentially can be ventilated. The hyperbaric O2 has been used. Uh, but the, the, the sine qua non of treatment is to provide 100% oxygen via non-rebreather. And the, the principle behind that is that um, the uh, oxygen, uh, higher concentration FiO2 oxygen, uh, displaces the carbon uh, monoxide um, six times faster than not being on that high uh, amount of oxygen. So uh, there, are, there is some data to uh, <clears throat> suggest that hyperbaric O2 uh, may be uh, indicated, certainly in patients uh, whose carboxy levels are high, or who have uh, myocardial ischemia, cardiac dysrhythmia, uh, neuropsychiatric abnormalities, et cetera. Um, the other thing that's very, very important um, is to realize that the uh, way we describe burns is, 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 this is called the Lund Browder, London Browder chart. Um, very important because we need to be able to communicate what areas are burnt, what percentage of the body surface that, that is, uh, and it has both therapeutic and prognostic implications, right? Uh, we decide therapy based on the percent TBSA. Uh, the higher percent burns that we have uh, will have a worsening uh, expectation of survival. Uh, also remember that uh, pediatric patients have a unique uh, body morphology, right? So they, their heads, uh, their, their craniums and heads are a bigger percentage of their total body surface area, their trunks uh, are a smaller percent. So the, these are these are commercially available and should be uh, documented on every burn patient. Uh, and certainly I think one of the ideal ways to do it is to document it sequentially. Um, so when I first see a patient uh, with a burn, uh, the, the caveats we mentioned previously in terms of healing time are very important, okay? And one should always have in the back of their mind that they would want a burn to heal within two to three weeks. Uh, if that happens, um, the uh, incidence of poor scarring goes down pretty dramatically. Uh, impairments to healing, uh, including infection, ischemia, uh, if we don't feed them enough, uh, uh, comorbidities, all those can cause uh, a wound that might, we might expect to heal to not heal. So. A lot of burn care obviously is directed at uh, fixing uh, those impairments to healing. Um, we talked about just cool water and Fiona Wood and all did this study uh, uh, of patients treated uh, with just water as first aid. Uh, and they show statistically significantly uh, that the following parameters, uh, risk of requiring grafts, risk of ICU admission, et cetera, decreased. For, for the reasons we mentioned. So again, pretty, pretty commonly accept, accepted uh, policy to just uh, apply room uh, temperature uh, water. Um, when you look at colonization of burn wounds, we talked about whether to leave blisters intact versus uh, non-intact. Non so when we leave blisters intact, the colonization rate, it is a good dressing. Uh, when we aspirate or de-roof them, the colonization goes up, not infection, but colonization, which makes sense. Uh, again, for me, the principle is if I, uh, if I have uh, blistering in an area where motion is impeded, I'll be much more likely to uh, uh, unroof or aspirate or, or remove that blister. Um, so we got through the primary survey. We then decide who we resuscitate. Uh, typically, adults greater than 20% TBSA, infants greater than 10% TBSA. Um, patients with inhalation injury may uh, need to be resuscitated if they have a smaller TBSA, as I mentioned earlier. Typically, there is about a 40 to 50% increase in uh, volume fluid requirements uh, in patients who, are, uh, who have an inhalation injury. So these, these, this rule of thumb of 20% and greater and 10% or greater in infants uh, is just a rule of thumb. Uh, one has to sort of use the art of burn care. Uh, we usually put Foley's in our larger burns and G-tubes, uh, rectal catheters only if uh, we have burn perineum or for a fecal control. The other thing to remember uh, is that uh, most burns, again, those larger burns that we're resuscitating, uh, lead to a hypermetabolic state and uh, that subsequently, if not treated appropriately, can lead to a lean, uh, loss of lean body mass as, as shown in this slide, uh, which can have a tremendous impact on burn care. 
Uh, and therefore one has to uh, match nutrition to the hypermetabolic picture, right? And typically we prefer just nasodenal tubes at admission uh, for patients greater than 20% TBSA and to begin tube feeds within six hours. Um, infection control is key. The most common causes of uh, infection in burn patients are listed here, bronchopneumonias, catheters, uh, urinary sepsis, peritonitis, enterocolitis, and valvulitis, um, the itis. Um, also remember that burn patients are bacteremic with each operative intervention. So um, when a patient comes back after a major surgery, they will typically have temperature, they'll have that inflammatory response, which is heightened after their uh, intervention. Pain management is key. There's lots of scales to use. I'm sure most of the audience is familiar with these. Very important to address pain. Uh, the modalities are listed here. There's a number of modalities. We, we just globally tend to use less opioids. I tend to use longer lasting uh, morphine type compounds, uh, which have also been shown to reduce post-traumatic stress. Um, confusion assessment is important. The CAM-ICU uh, scale, uh, delirium assessment, it should be done actually every day. Uh, and if uh, patients are delirious, uh, they can be treated. So we're at wound management. There's lots of ways to treat the wound. Uh, you can treat the wound expectantly with dressings, cytotherapy, topical agents, systemic agents. I think one of the key things to remember out of this is that we want to make a decision about wound care early, and we want to work towards definitive closure. And Again, I do have an algorithm-driven approach to wound assessment, not important, and this isn't, uh, you know, this isn't uh, something that you have to do. Uh, but again, it's great for communication. It's great for the team to understand. And a big part of my uh, algorithms are based on the use of collagenase and polysporin uh, to get rid of pseudo SCAR to make a decision to operate early. Uh, there is some recent evidence that suggests the use of collagenase, for example, uh, tends to decrease the inflammatory cells, uh, and uh, tends to prevent uh, further necrosis. Uh, and again, that was pig data just recently done. Uh, so, so and, and then one has to decide how we're going to close the patient, whether it be through dressings uh, or through surgery. And topical therapies, I think the key thing here is not to provide a two-hour overview of this, but rather to realize that everything we use can have negative consequences. So the sulfadiazine still is the most commonly used thing can cause leukopenia or argyria. Uh, also remember that it inhibits epithelialization. Acetracin, 25% of patients have a delayed uh, sensitivity reaction. Silver nitrate can cause a, a methemoglobinemia and stains everything. So, so really be careful and thoughtful about what we use. Acetic acid soaks are a common thing that are used, at least in my center. Uh, one has to also decide what concentration of both acetic acid and Dakin's we're using because uh, we wanna make sure that if we're treating appropriately that we're using something that's bactericidal. So acetic acid, for example, is bactericidal at a 0.5% solution and it's less effective at a quarter strength. So half strength is probably best. <clears throat> and these applied uh, two to three times a day. Uh, and again, everything has potential complications. Dakin's sodium hypochlorite, same thing, quarter to half. It's bactericidal, fungicidal, viricidal. It's effective against a number of uh, different organisms. Uh, tends to dry up your wound a little bit too, which can be helpful in some situations. Same sort of thing. Remember that Dakin's is toxic to hypo, hypo to, I'm sorry, to fibroblasts. It may cause delays in epithelialization. So one has to be very careful cognitively on uh, type of therapy, and, but also duration of therapy in these patients. Uh, silver, I think has changed uh, one of those uh, um, products or, or concepts that has changed burn care delivery in my lifetime. Uh, the nanocrystalline technology was uh, came out about 15 years ago. Uh, it's bactericidal against a number of gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, yeast, and fungi. And I tend to use a lot of the antimicrobial dressings. Uh, don't, don't moisten with saline because that uh, deactivates the silver uh, and a variety of products are available. Acticoat is, is probably the most common thing I use. Uh, three to seven day antimicrobial activity. There's Acticoat Flex, Absorbent, Moisture Control, et cetera. Um, we don't want to use it in patients with allergy to silver, and it can cause a transient, which always goes away, discoloration of the skin. Therabond is another uh, product 
It's a antimicrobial technology, uh, 3D, uh, based on a three-dimensional matrix. Uh, again, allows exudate and excess fluid removal. Uh, and the other advantage is it provides gentle compression. Aleven AG, similarly, uh, allows for a moist healing environment. It uh, allows you to reduce bacterial flow. But in my, in my practice, it is also a great stent uh, for grafts to the back, for example, uh, or, pay, or areas that are highly mobile. Um, um, it can be left in place for seven days, and it's rather easy to apply. Here's what it looks like. Mepilex AG uh, is another uh, uh, silver product, uh, antimicrobial soft silicone foam dressing, again, for exudated wounds. Uh, and most of these tend to inactivate the pathogen within 30 days. So we can, so we can treat topically, we can get a wound to heal, or we have to make a decision to operate or not operate. So the technique of excision, uh, excision can be either on the right side enzymatically uh, or, or on the left side tangentially to full thickness. So uh, really that is, those are uh, decisions that are made, uh, um, the surgical decisions are made in the operating room. Collagenase, as I mentioned before, is a big part of my wound treatment algorithm. It's an enzymatic debrider that, that digests collagen with an appropriate pH. Uh, it's useful in partial thickness burns, uh, full thickness burns, uh, pressure ulcers, et cetera. Um, so uh, typically we will mix it with an antimicrobial. Uh, and also remember that if you've got thicker eschar and you want the collagen to get to the wound bed and lift the eschar, you may have to cross hatch it or micro needle it or provide some other means uh, to be able to get the drug to the, uh, to the wound. Uh, it may cause some pain and transient erythema. A couple of quick case examples, lower extremity burn, prohibitive risk. These patients were all treated outpatient, healed by two, two weeks. I apologize for the blurriness of the picture, but a chemical injury to the face on a male, uh, eight days of treatment, uh, and then a year follow-up, uh, good aesthetic result um, and uh, no, no issues. Uh, operatively, we want to excise all patients by day two to five. And I'm talking about the larger burn, but definitely by day seven, uh, there are studies that have shown that early excision and grafting shorten hospital time, decrease costs and lower morbidity. Um, early excision and grafting reduces pain, accelerates return to normal function and decreases wound infection and mortality. Um, the basic caveats of, of excision should be performed when depth of burn injury is apparent, uh, when epithelialization is delayed beyond three weeks, because as I mentioned before, the incidence of hypertrophic scarring goes up, uh, and grafting by three week three by week three absolutely improves results. Um, tangential excision, as seen here, removes that zone of coagulation that we've talked about. Right, uh, you had to be careful with blood loss in these patients. Uh, one has to be uh, communicative with anesthesia uh, to let them know exactly what uh, is going on and how much blood we're losing. Full thickness excision of fascia, as seen here, uh, is uh, is a it, it's a good bet for grafting. It tends to produce a, a poor cosmetic outcome and over joints and things like that. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult uh, to provide coverage. Um, most important to survival is coverage. So one has to carefully think about what areas we wanna prioritize. But we also wanna think about those areas that we represent ourselves to society, the hands and faces and neck that should be grafted perhaps in a different way with sheet grafts, et cetera. Um, and then to plan all that in terms of coverage. Uh, wound coverage options are as follows. Uh, cadaver skin, uh, typically frozen is available more than fresh. It's the gold standard currently for temporary closure of excised wounds. Uh, it reduces fluid loss, decreases pain, uh, decreases metabolic demands. The other thing that I, uh, I think about uh, using cadaver skin uh, is simply that it is a good test of your wound bed. If you've done an appropriate excision, and you've gotten down, you've gotten all of the zone of coagulation off, uh, your homograph should stick to the wound bed at least temporarily. And that tells me that that bed will be ready for grafting. Uh, it is expensive, it carries a small risk of disease transmission, and you do still most of the time need uh, an additional procedure to close the wound. And again, this is just a patient excised to fascia with uh, adherent cadaver skin tells me that uh, for the most part, this wound uh, looks good. It's ready for autografting. Autograft is transplantation of patient skin from one area of the body to the other. Most commonly in burns, we use split thickened skin grafts where a, all of the epidermis 
and a portion of the dermis is removed in a controlled manner. There are areas such as the hand, et cetera, uh, or the eyelids where we tend to use full thickness grafts, uh, where we have to use all the epidermis uh, and, and all of the dermis uh, to provide uh, repletion. And again, this is a patient, cadaver skin on the left, cadaver skin and grafted on the right, and sheet grafts on the extreme right um, because of a smaller area and a more difficult wound, a more exposed wound to society. Uh, I tend to use a lot of fibrin sealant, uh, uh, not important which one, but uh, fibrin sealant for sealing my grafts that tends to reduce uh, seroma collection that tends to allow you to range the patient much earlier um, and uh, provides good apposition of the graft to the wound bed. And this is just an example of a patient. Uh, this is on the operating table, by the way, with a block where we can graft the patient uh, and allow them to move immediately. And as you can see, uh, from extension to flexion, that graft does not move. So certainly if they can do that in the operating room, they can do it at post-op day uh, one. Um, for larger wounds, uh, there are many other techniques to obtain coverage. Cultured epithelial autograft is one of those ways, and we have a, a rather large experience with CEA. This is a 96% burn patient, uh, front surface, back surface, completely excised and covered with cadaver. As you can see, this is CEA. This is cultured cells placed with bridal veil on top. This is early, and this is a, a two-year follow-up, close-up cultured cell throughout with, uh, in this patient, an alloderma space, uh, but you have to have some kind of dermal base for the cultured cells to work more optimally. Most recently, uh, about two and a half years ago, our, our, our autologous cell harvesting uh, keratinocyte uh, device was approved by the FDA. Uh, harvested from a split thickness skin graft. Uh, and uh, the, actually it's completely uh, approved now. And a two by two sonomer piece of skin as shown on the left will give you about four cc's of, of uh, keratinocytes, which will cover about 320 square centimeters. And this is the FDA phase two studies that we were involved with. Uh, just showing you, uh, this is week 12, autologous harvest down there. And you can see the mesh pattern of the graft. And then finally, the, the final phase is rehabilitation phase uh, where scar remodeling, handling PTSD, bystander uh, stress, calculation imp of impairment ratings, and then reconstruction. And again, this is to me a very multidisciplinary approach. The therapist's role in functional recovery, in my opinion, is extremely critical. And we use a lot of different scar modulation therapies, pressure, silicone, ultrasound, lasers, and filling of fat. Uh, it starts on admission through the outpatient setting, uh, and rehab is, is a part, I didn't mean to imply that rehab just comes in the recon phase, it is present, and these, these therapists are involved all the way through burn care. Uh, and again, the goal is to return to a functional level. These are just pressure garments. Uh, fat grafting, uh, we, uh, I tend to do a fair amount of fat grafting uh, for patients with uh, full thickness injury or, or in areas that uh, require more glide. Uh, and the Coleman technique is typically what we use. Uh, laser is the other modality. I typically start my laser therapies uh, six weeks post burn injury, and we treat with both the PDL and the Fraxel CO2. Uh, again, PDL for redness and itching, and the fractional for uh, pliability, thickness, and texture. And again, this is pre and post. This is pre and post. And I think I'm gonna stop there and uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you so much for listening. Well, hello everybody and uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, this is Dr. Sood, Raj Sood. Uh, and I have a list of questions um, that I'm just gonna read and uh, try to answer as best I can. The first one is from Kaiser Permanente and they just say, thank you. Well, you're welcome. I hope you enjoyed that talk. It was a, it was a sort of a rushed, you know, fifty some minute talk um, on on burn care. And you know, I've been doing burns for thirty some years, and fascinating for me to to realize that there have been a number of major developments in terms of improving burn care. A lot of them have been sort of in the, the part that I'm interested in, which is uh, wound closure, keratinocytes, skin substitutes, et cetera. And so. You know, I hope I hope you got a flavor of that from this talk. But obviously, 
you know, it doesn't, the talk doesn't lend, lend itself to any depth uh, in terms of those conversations. Um, the question, uh, next question is, um, have you tried the new nanoparticle matrix on your burn patients? I, I don't know which particular matrix you're talking about. Uh, I uh, was very involved with nanoparticle silver uh, matrix development. Uh, with uh, the PhD you developed it. And when I say I was involved, I was on the clinical side and, and helped with that concept and used it on my patients and uh, were able to develop some larger, fairly large series of use. Um, I, I believe very, very, very strongly in nanoparticles, silver delivery methods. Uh, I realized that there are other delivery methods which are good as well. Um, several important points to think about. Number one, how much silver do you need? How fast do you need it? Where do you need it? How does it get delivered, right? Uh, oh, and five, what happens to the silver, the actual silver moieties uh, that are uh, released from the dressing? And so the, the, matrix, that I, the matrix that I'm most familiar with um, has a rapid 30-minute onset of action. Uh, it is uh, uh, effective against gram-positive, gram-negative fungi for about seven days and uh, needs to be moistened. Uh, really, it's the only care required. It comes in multiple forms of three-day, seven-day, et cetera. Um, but one of the things I like is when you look at the parts per million of silver delivered, it is quite high. Uh, and, you know, one might say, well, what, what, what does that do? Well, two things. When you look at the rate of kill of bacteria, the amount of silver delivered is very important. Uh, in addition, the MIC, the minimum inhibitory concentration of, anti of antibiotic that you need, uh, for some of these bacteria like uh, the highly resistant Pseudomonas and MRSA are up to 30 to 40 parts per million. So having dressings or, or delivery modes that have uh, very low parts per million, there are several dressings with one to two parts per million, it's a good um, a sort of a static kind of uh, dressing, bacteria static. Uh, but, but the higher concentration of silver allow you to exceed the MIC for most of these bacteria, especially the particularly virulent with bacteria. So when you're choosing uh, silver dressing, think about, yes, I like nanoparticles I, for the reasons I've elucidated, uh, but also think about how much, how much uh, silver is actually being delivered. As I said, that, that is really what the important uh, facts and consideration are. Uh, Dorothy Parson, what is the most effective initial treatment for burns? Uh, I assume, I, so, you know, that sort of depends. It's a great question, but sort of depends. You know, there are outpatient burns and then those that require admission, and I covered some of those criteria uh, for us during the talk. Outpatient burns, you know, unfortunately or fortunately, most of the country still uses silvadine in emergency rooms and silver sulfidizing uh, uh, in emergency rooms and doctor's offices. And frankly, for most burns, that's okay. Simple uh, bacitracin, polymyxin is okay. Remember, we talked about uh, delayed sensitivity and uh, urticarial reactions with that, so be careful of that. Um, I think the basic principle here is use what you want. Use an antimicrobial, uh, debride as you need to. Uh, for larger burns, I think I've given you my algorithm. I, I tend to use a lot of Santol. Uh, collagenase to make an earlier determination of uh, the wound bed and whether I need to operate or not operate. So outpatient is a little bit different than inpatient. Uh, certainly, I, I for many years, I, I lectured at the American Academy of Pediatrics in terms of pediatric burn care and specifically, you know, talk to them about the use of collagenase in the outpatient setting. You can get it with a prescription. I, most pharmacies may take a day or so to get um, but, again, it's a very effective tool uh, to be able to uh, allow us to determine uh, what the best surgical or non-surgical course is uh, for that patient. The next question is, Marie Felix, uh, what is the new protocol now in, in bathing burn patients with large little body surface area? Great question. Again, uh, hydrotherapy is still used in burn care. In fact, the center I came from, we routinely use hydrotherapy, and we are not immersing as well. We're using uh, shower tables, uh, which are a little more hygienic per se, um, but we will still immerse patients as they've uh, completed healing. Um, but the shower tables, uh, the advantage of shower tables for cleansing wounds and providing hydrotherapy 
is uh, nice because they can actually be, you know, depending on the design of the burn center, can be wheeled into the um, uh, into the patient's room, uh, and so it provides a very effective means of of uh, providing therapy. Now, I will tell you that a lot of centers and a lot of burn surgeons do feel that immersion therapy is passe. Uh, I tend to be not one of those people who believe that. Um, uh, from Glenwood Trauma, thanks for talk. I work in the ED. What, what do you suggest we wash the wounds with? Uh, I prefer using the uh, silver uh, foam dressings on partial thickness wounds. Um, or pre-dressing, washing is also very important. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I, you know, something as simple as soap and water is okay with me. Hemoclans, I mean, anything will typically hurt the patient. Uh, gentle debridement is best with uh, with water, sterile water. Uh, to me, uh, debreathing blisters or dead skin, as it were. And then I do like the concept of of uh, using um, uh, silver foam dressings on the patients. One of the big advantages of of that type of dressing is that you can leave it on. I like I like things that I like dressings, especially if we're going to send patients out of an emergency room uh, that are useful, uh, and and particularly in terms of not having the patients change a lot of dressings. Uh, so if we, one can debride a wound adequately, that's one of the first caveats, and then apply some kind of silver dressing in the ED, I think that is a great way to temporize them for three to five days. So uh, great, great thought. Um, how do you fixate the dressings? Uh, it's also useful to use a tubular net bandage or dressings have to be exposed. Oh, great question. No, no I... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. No, I think they need to be uh, not exposed. Uh, I think they need to be provided with a, you know, we know that the cellular component of wound healing does better in a moist wound environment. And so I believe in uh, closed dressings. Um, I believe in a moisture controlled uh, type dressing. Um, I do use tubular uh, bandages, which are great for trunk and arms, et cetera, to keep dressings in place. So. Uh, yeah, very good question. What type of antimicrobial do you use with collagenase? Great question. Polysporin typically, uh, and it's a three-to-one mixture. Uh, very easy to do. The patient can do it at home. They can do it on a towel, sterile towel, or a sterile area that they create. Uh, mix it with a tongue blade, uh, preferably sterile as well, and then apply it to the wound. Uh, but again, very easy to teach patients uh, uh, wound care. Let's see. Ah, what are your thoughts on medical grade honey for use in burns? I, I think it's a good gentle debreeding and uh, semi antimicrobial tool. I don't tend to use it a lot in my practice, uh, primarily because you know this is a lecturer is doing a lot of inpatient burn unit stuff versus a lot of outpatient wounds. Uh, I do know that there are people and other centers that have very good success uh, for gentle, very gentle debris bond. Uh, and uh, producing concomitantly a antimicrobial component uh, to wound care. So uh, I think that is a decent option. Um, can I use sodium hypochlorite to treat a wound? Well, I, I think I just mentioned that, yes. Uh, I think that the key thing is for, for use depends on uh, type of wound, dilution, do you want it static or sidal? Uh, and I think I covered uh, that in my talk. Uh, but just, you know, that's easily available information that you can look up and uh, absolutely, absolutely can use it. It does tend to dry the wound a little bit, so there, there are some wounds that are exudative, uh, and we will want to, uh, and we will want to uh, use a agent that will help us dry the wound. Um, really cool and easy to understand the algorithm. Is it accessible? Well, the problem is that algorithm, when I, when I develop those algorithms, all of them that you saw, uh, they're part of a hospital consortium algorithm. I don't know whether we can share them or not, uh, but certainly something that uh, uh, we can look into. Uh, oil burns only applied to pediatrics only. Question, what about those burns that are caused by boiling water or are they called deeper burns? Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean. Uh, oil burns can occur both in adults and peds, as we know. Uh, scald burns, boiling water burns, as you call them, uh, uh, they, they can result in a deeper injury. Again, the, the principle is it's related to all the things I talked about in my talk, duration of exposure, uh, you know, heat of the offending agent, uh, where, where they spilled, et cetera, adult versus child, 
Um, but both both those type of burns can occur with um, uh, oil and water. Next question. Uh, thanks for the talk. I work in the ED. Oh, hey, we already went over that. I got a thank you, and I got a thank you very much for the informative presentation. Um, Oh, what would you, uh, and I think it's maybe close to my last question, what would you suggest to dress a burn covering an entire back? Facebook's fairly mobile, and we had issues with keeping the burn grass from sticking to her, causing increased pain. Yeah, you know, you're, you're talking about something that is difficult. That's a great point. Um, we tend to use, um, and I forget what they're called, but they're sort of uh, dressings that can be tied. So you apply the primary dressing onto the patient's back, uh, and then either using a gel in that or, or uh, this particular type of dressing that comes to you just kind of log roll, log roll the patient on one side, log roll them back onto the dressing, and these can be tied, uh, are probably the best for, um, uh, for uh, the entire back. Uh, what is the current best practice for caring for graft harvesites? Great question. No consensus you could beat. 20 burn surgeons today, and we give you 20 different answers. Here's my basic principle thought process, which is keep it moist, keep it um, pain-free. Uh, for smaller wound dressings, I use opt Opsite, uh, which has been shown to be the best at relieving pain on an outpatient basis. You can use Xeriform, extremely cheap. I make sure that once the dressing comes off, we dry that Xeriform with either, if they're outpatient with a low heat hair dryer, et cetera, uh, for, for Inpatient burns that I send out, uh, MEPI AG, which is a, a silver foam dressing, is what I typically use. Um, is silver mesh the best to allow drainage as opposed to silver AG or foam? I don't know if I can give you that answer. Uh, I think it's a, prefer a preference thing. Um, I think it depends not just on the, the silver component of it, but what the vehicle or, you know, what we're carrying it on. If we need, a, if we need to be able to wick, um, moisture out of that wound, well, then we need to pick an appropriate foam or, or a uh, silver impregnated foam type dressing. So that's, that is typically what my preference is. Um, I'm just going through the rest of the questions. I think I covered uh, most of these. Uh, somebody said, yes, I love Xeroform. Me too. It's cheap. Uh, you know, the only problem with Xeroform in larger burns uh, and reharvested donor sizes is sometimes take longer to heal them. And when we used them a lot back in Indiana in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we noticed that our donor site cellulitis or this erythema you get around the wound was a problem. So uh, just be careful uh, of that scenario. I think our time is almost up. It's 2.33, so I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Um, thank you for listening.